Ladies and gentlemen, whether you follow the world of chess closely or not, I'd be willing to bet that you can name several famous chess players. You could start in the modern times. Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura. Maybe you go back a couple of decades. Garry Kasparov. Go back another couple of decades. Bobby Fischer. I think it's pretty normal that even if you don't follow a sport closely, you can name some of its most famous athletes. But even if you do follow a sport pretty closely, there are some hidden gems that you may or may not have ever heard of. And that is the purpose of today's video. I'm going to be covering the most famous international master to ever live. How is he the most famous? Well, his name is Rashid Nyashmedinov. And he was one of the most feared attacking players of the entire 20th century. He never became a world champion, never even got a grandmaster title, but his story is absolutely unbelievable. And I cannot let the legend die just because we live in the age of social media and, you know, we only follow the grandmasters and the greats of the past because Rashid was an unbelievable player. Let me tell you a little bit about his story and then I will show you some of his unbelievable chess games. Rashid Nashmedinov was born in 1912 in what is modern-day Kazakhstan, a region of Russia that was very, very poor. His parents died when he was very young. And from the history that I've read, it was literally due to being overworked, which is horrible. Then there was the Russian Civil War. And that obviously caused famine, poverty beyond belief. He was raised in unbelievably difficult times. He had an older brother. His older brother actually went on to become a world-class poet, which is just an incredible side detail of the story. Now, Rashid only got into chess for the first time around the age of 15. He was quite good at it, but he also had a massive affinity for checkers. How about that? Checkers and chess. Checkers was widely respected in the Soviet Union at those times. Then, in 1933, already at the age of 21, he took checkers more seriously than chess until 1936. Rashid was 23, 24 years old when he was defeated by some strong chess players, category one chess players, not grandmasters, not, not even masters, and he got mad. He wanted to learn chess and he wanted to beat those guys. But then he got sick. He spent the late 30s in a hospital reading chess endgame books. That is how he got into chess, really legitimately for the first time, nearly 30 years of age. And then there was World War II. The first time that Rashid had an opportunity to really seriously play chess was after World War II ended in 1946. 1946. He was 34 years of age. 34 years of age. And he had a positive record against world chess champions. Mikhail Tal, Boris Spassky, and then players that never became world champions like David Bronstein or Lev Palugayevsky. But his record against them was positive. He was a fearsome brutal attacking player. And I would like to share a couple of games with you so that the legend of Nishmedinov can live on. I have two unbelievable queen sacrifices. I have a win versus Mikhail Tsal, one of the most revered and feared attacking players of that generation as well. And the last one is a feel-good story beyond belief. Uh, well, I don't want to spoil anything. Let's begin. This is a game played against... Oleg Chernikov, and it is probably the most famous queen sacrifice uh, known uh, in the chess world. Nishbidinov loved e4. He loved open games, he loved queens and bishops getting out and about. c5, knight f3, knight c6, and in this game we have an open Sicilian. It's a Sicilian defense where we have an imbalance right away, and white plays this move pawn to d4 to open up the lines. Black tries to put the bishop on g7. That's called a fianchetto, in case this video gets recommended to people in the YouTube algorithm that have never played chess before. Welcome to the chess world. That is a little house that you are building for the bishop. And this particular street in the city of the Sicilian defense is called the dragon, knight c3, bishop g7. And white chooses whether he will castle the long way or the short way. Bishop c4, bishop b3. And Chernikov plays this move knight to g4, deflecting the white queen away from the defense of the knight in the center of the board. You're trying to get this bishop. Knights are generally considered slightly better than bishops. But Chernikov already made a fatal mistake when he played this move. And you might say, Gotham, what are you talking about? It's just a trade of pieces. 
The problem is you removed your knight, which is used to protect your king, and you allowed Nishmedinov to float his queen near your kingside. This is like the start of an avalanche. This is not something that you want to be close to when it begins falling. Now, Nishmedinov did not need to castle queenside to start an attack on the king. And traditional wisdom tells you you play this move, but actually then black would be able to strip away the defenses of the white king and it would be very, very unpleasant. So instead of that, he goes short side. And you would think when the kings are castled on the same side, it's very difficult to start an attack against the other player. It's very difficult. How are you going to do that? Bishop f6? Yeah, bishop f6. I mean, that's kind of the point right there. Now, you could get in close, then I'm going to slide back. That's probably what Chernikov had in mind. He also probably had in mind the fact that, well, I mean, if queen h3, you, you get sniped by the bishop over there, black opens up the position. And after bishop 2 f6, you know, if you play queen g3, there's this nifty move, queen takes knight, with the idea to go knight fork and get the queen. So he thought, bishop f6, I'm, I'm in good shape. But what he failed to realize was that Rashid Nishmedinov was a madman. Do you know what the G in Rashid's name stands for? It stands for gangster. Rashid Gangster Nizhmedinov. It actually stands for Gibiatovich. But it gangster. And in this position, Rashid Nizhmedinov sacrificed his queen for the bishop. That looks like a four-year-old played that move. That looks like a four-year-old went, I get a bishop, but then he takes my queen, but we both got one piece, so it's equal. Queen takes f6 is unbelievable. And the purpose of queen takes f6 is to get the bishop in the knight and to just attack the black king who somehow has a really damaged pawn structure that cannot be properly defended. And it's not just a matter of the structure. It's the fact that after this, black is in serious trouble. Because now you've got discovered checks on the king and the attack will go on and on and on. So, Chernikov sacrifices his knight like this. He gives up the knight to try to take back the position. Dishmedinov says, bro, you just delayed the inevitable. I'm going right back. I'm going right back to where I started. This man just straight up gave up a queen for a bishop. He got a knight for it too, but wh what's the justification? The justification is, watch and see. The knight goes to d5. The rook defends, the bishop attacks the pawn, and now he just centralizes all of his pieces. He just centralizes his pieces. Nishmedinov plays in a way where Stockfish begins to appreciate his moves over time. Stockfish doesn't get it. It doesn't quite understand. I mean, of course it does if I have like the Google Cloud here, but it, it slowly but surely realizes, wait a minute, this attack is really, really, really strong. Like the only way to defend yourself might be to start giving up rooks for these pieces in order to improve your pawn structure in order to get the pawns together, to get these bishop it trades and, and remove some pieces from the board. But Chernikov waited too long to do that. He played bishop b5. And, 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 and he went back and then took. And now he sacrificed a rook as well. He said, I don't need that rook. I don't need that rook. Because if you take that rook, you're forgetting about my four other pieces. At which point I would play knight to g4, discover check. And then I would get a rook. And then I would go here. And all your pieces are, are just standing around. They're figurines. They're not actually participating in the game. Knight takes f6. Chernikov played this move to go after the rook that matters. The rook that is playing in the attack. Knight takes h7. Discovered attack. You cannot take the knight. It's a Trojan horse. Rook h3, rook h8, rook f7 as well. Right? Rook f7. I think rook h3, there's bishop h5, which is very important. Which is why you have to play rook f7. Rook h3, rook e5, and he just continues the attack. He just absolutely, he doesn't even take the rook. He doesn't even take the rook. Look at these pieces. Look, look at the symphony, that the, the, the harmony, the symphony that these pieces conduct. Knight back to g5. The rook can't move. The rook can't move because it's made on the back rank. Bishop takes f7. Rook takes f7. And now the attraction tactic, rook h8. Oh my god. This man used... Every single piece he had. Bishop, this is a man that got into chess seriously in, in his 30s. Rook f7, rook h8. You attract the king like a magnet into a 
devastating family fork, and when the dust settles, it is White who is completely winning. This is just a winning endgame. You don't have to win this game by checkmate. In this position, should Nikov resign because, say he plays a6, White will go g3, kick out the rook, and then slowly win these pawns. There's just nothing black can do. What a game. Queen takes f6. That was the kind of guy that Rashid Nishmedinov was. I got another queen sacrifice for you, but first I'm going to show you this game against Mikhail Tal. And by the way, this game was played in 1961. Mikhail Tal in the middle of a world championship reign. He won in uh, 1959. Uh, no, he won in 1960 and then lost in 1961. It's either 59 and 60 or 60 and 61. Two adjacent years. Tal defeated Botvinnik in a, in a crazy match that captivated the entire Soviet Union. Frankly, the world as well, I would imagine. And then he lost the revenge match. And like I said already, this is the stuff that Rashid lives for. He loves these Sicilians. This one is a, uh, is a Shevinigan. It's a, it's a Nidorf Sicilian. This is what Tal lived for as well. These are probably... This is a matchup of the two greatest dynamic players of that generation. I mean, think about that. This is like, th this is like uh, you know, your, 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 your favorite heavyweight boxers going at it, and you just really don't know who's going to win. Queen c7, Nizhmedinov wastes absolutely zero time. He doesn't develop his pieces. He plays f4, and then he plays g4, launching all the pawns forward. You know, when Tal saw this, he must have salivated. He must have... He Tal was the kind of guy that probably got, if he was a boxer, would get punched, blood dripping down his face. He would, he would taste it. He would laugh. That's the kind of guy that he was. F4, G4. We castle the king here. We don't even hide him. We just go for an attack. Now we stop Tal's advances. Tal develops his pieces. We develop. Tal lunges into the center of the board. We safeguard our center with queen e2. I love how this is just like a, infra, it's like a nervous system overload. He's not playing it. He's not playing it just yet. He doesn't know if he wants to push his pieces back. It's just making Tal think. Now Tal can't resist anymore. He plays e5, trying to strike into the center of the board. But now knight f5, zigging and zagging out to the f5 square. Tal plays g6. Now Nizhmedinov plays an in-between move. Pawn takes pawn. Attacking the knight on f6 and also opening the door to his bishop, which now the knight plants itself on the h6 square, just standing on the outskirts of the black position. Yelling things, pressuring the position. Tal plays knight e6, looking to seize control of the dark squares. Nishpidinov plays a move that seems like it does nothing. But this move opens up the rook. That's the idea. That's why the move f takes e5 was so important. That's why the move e5 for black was such a gamble. It might have not been necessary. Tal might have opened more doors for white than for himself by playing a move like that. Bishop g7. And now the white attack has sort of been stopped. What do you play in this position? If you play g5, I actually sneak in this capture because the pawn here doesn't scare me. The pawn here does not scare me. I will move this knight. I'll move the knight h5, put the knight on f4. I'm going to be very happy. We're going to get a crazy looking position of knights versus bishops. Bishop g2, bishop g7. Tal must have thought, well, I'm all right. And then I'm going to continue my attack. Maybe I'll even go long over there in the future. But he forgot that he was playing Rashid Nishmedinov. Because in this position, Rashid Nishmedinov sacrificed the rook the, on the exact same square as in the game against Chernyukov. Rook takes f6. The idea is actually very straightforward. It just has to do with control over the d5 square. Now you would think that move makes no sense because your rook is gone. You have no attack anymore. An entire potent, powerful attacking piece is gone. But what's more important is the knight coming to d5. Because black actually cannot take this knight. It invites way too many problems. So instead of that, black goes here. Now Nishbidinov slides the queen over to the f2 square. Fights for the dark squares and threatens stuff along the f file. Tal now has to jump in his knight and give it away. Now, do you think Nishbidinov will trade the bishop for the knight? Or the knight for the knight. Traditional wisdom tells you knight for knight is probably better. It's better to preserve the bishop. No, 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 no. It's better to take with the bishop. For two reasons. 
One, you need to preserve the knight to apply pressure. Two, it's all about timing. You get the rook into the game as fast as possible. E takes F4, and just before we do that, we lunge into the center of the board with E5. We surrender the control of the knight completely, because if bishop takes D5 is played in this position, you open up the king. Rook E1 is a devastating threat. Bishop G2 is possible. Queen E1. King would go to F8. I would then bounce the, ping, the king back into the center like a ping pong ball, and I would play Rook E7, and devastating impact would arrive, as well as Rook D1, which obviously just wins the queen, which is also good enough. E5 opens up the position. You're looking to bring in the rook like this. Now, Tal plays bishop takes. Tal never want to shy away from a fight. It actually, according to the engine, would have been better to play bishop h4. There was no stockfish back in the day. Tal tries to defend himself like this, but he forgets who he's playing. Rashid Nishmedinev sacrificing yet another piece on the f6 square. Now queen to d4. Look at this. The knight standing on the outskirts is just preventing the king from sliding over and getting out of danger. Now, the bishops are still staring at each other. The rook is still pressuring. Nezhmedinov was a god amongst men when, he, when it came to extracting the maximum effect of devastation with his pieces. He, he just bulldozes the position, queen d8, and now the way we get the queen into the attack is very simple. We sacrifice the rook again. Two rooks sacrificed in one game. This is hardly a sacrifice. This is more of a discovered attack. Tal accepted the capture. Queen h8, the king is mercilessly hunted into the center of the board, and pawn takes f5, and Tal resigned, because after king d6, Nizhmedinov would have went here, he would have taken his queen, he would have taken his bishop, he would have taken his soul. You would think, in a clash of two titans like this, one of them would be upset when he lost, as if to say that he was not the alpha, Right? Although I think the alpha thing of wolves has been like disproven, but whatever, we all just say alpha anyway. But actually, Mikhail Tal said that one of the best days of his life was when he lost to Nishmidinov. It's, it's a quote. I wasn't there to verify that quote. That's what Tal said. It's all you have to know about him as a sportsman, as an athlete, as an individual. Now, Lev Palugoyevsky, one of the best players of that generation as well, versus Rashid Nishmidinov. This time, Rashid has the black pieces. Rashid always look for confrontation early. Although, what's interesting about this is, this might have been the best thing to do against Rashid Nishmedinov. Get him into a queenless middle game. How is he going to checkmate you without a queen? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Okay, we saw in the Chernikov game, he literally sacrificed it. But, you know, this was still a dynamic position. This is a much more positional game. No. We get e4. And now we have an imbalanced game. All right, Rashid plays bishop g7, castles. And Rashid immediately instigates confrontation with knight to g4 and queen h4. As if to say, if you castle pre-move here, Lev, I'm going to play queen takes h2. But obviously that doesn't happen. But Rashid doesn't stop. The confrontation, f5. This is just about the worst type of game that you could play against Rashid Nishbidinov if you're trying to survive. Because he plants his queen firmly outside of your position, right? He's got the bishop, he's got the rook, he's got the knights dancing in the center of the board. And it's like, somehow, you know, the players that figured out Nishmedinov at the time were players like Petrosian, Karchnoi, players who were technicians. They were really good defenders, they were stubborn defenders. And they didn't let him have his fun. But some players couldn't, couldn't resist. I mean, there was, like, Tal couldn't resist. And some players just, they had no answer. Bishop h6. Seizing control of the diagonal. Right, Palugayevsky plays queen d1. And already, as early as the 14th move of the game, we see Rashid g is for gangster Nishmedinov have a very pleasant position. And it's an avalanche. The pawn comes down to the f4 square. The knight comes here. And this is just a same side attacking masterclass. If you want to attack your opponent on the same side, a couple of conditions have to be met. Number one, your opponent's pieces cannot cause any harm to your king once you start advancing your pawns. Now, the way you think about that is you have to look at your opponent's pieces. Yeah, white's pieces don't really impress anybody. They're kind of stuck. This knight can come to d5 and open up the bishop, but if the knight comes to d5, black plays rook f7 and everything is guarded. Number two, when you attack like this, the center has to be closed. And right now, Nishmedinov has the knights and the d6 pawn completely sealing the center shut. It's almost impossible to open up the center. White could play c5. Black could completely ignore it. Black could take it, but even taking it weakens the center. 
The best move is not to take it, it's to continue the attack, because by the time you get all of this, you're gonna lose. By the time you open up the center, Black strips you of all your defenses, and brutally checkmates you and embarrasses you. So, those are the conditions that have to be met. Knight to d5 was played in the game, and Yezhmedinov played g4, and Palugoyevsky said, all right, you know what? I'm tired of getting bullied. I'm going to stand up to you. And Yezhmedinov said, okay, good luck. F4. With the idea, if knight f3 check, the king actually escapes. This is incredible. Look at this defensive idea, putting the king on e3. This is what Palugoyevsky was banking on. He was banking on the fact that his king was actually going to go on a spiritual journey. And then he would play rook h1, and then he would counterattack. What he failed to realize was he was playing one of the most resourceful attacking players that has ever lived. And that resourceful attacking player just developed his bishop calmly and said, you can't take me because then I will absolutely brutalize you with bishop takes and bishop e3. Bishop e6 is a gangster move. That's why his nickname is G, because knight c7 is a fork. But knight c7 would run into absurd complications following a sacrifice on the f4 square. If the knight takes, there's queen g3. If the rook takes, rook takes. If the pawn takes, I take the bishop and knight f3 as well. If knight takes, I just showed you what happens. So you can't do any of that. Instead, we have the bishop going back to c2. And now Palugayevsky tried to go on this king walk. And my man, my man, Rashid Nishmedinov, removed the defender of the white position, galloped with his knight out to the edge of the board. The rook came to counterattack the queen. The queen is 100% hanging. 100% percent hanging but Rashid saw something Lev Palugoyevsky did not see in this position Nezhmedinov played rook takes f4 dear god completely leaving his queen to die didn't sacrifice it for anything didn't take a knight like he did in the first game he just left the queen to die and the reason is if you take which by the way you have to take if this, I just keep attacking your king. Here, knight takes f4, queen g3, knight c2 check, by the way, look at that. So bad. Rook h2, rook f3, and now bishop to g7. The king does not have a legal move. Look at Stockfish realizing a little bit late how bad the situation is. The threat is to just attack with the pawn, but it's even more brutal than that. It's to attack with the pawn and then take with the pawn. It's not to take with a knight. It's a pawn capture situation where despite being up eight points of material, white is up a queen for a pawn. It's over. You can't defend your king. This is unfathomable. Now, the best move to defend yourself was like moving this knight. For example, knight c3. If c5, d, c, b, c, you got to sack your queen back. You got to sack your queen back into a fork and then you got to try to survive this position where there's, you know, knight d2 and knight h2. And, and apparently it's a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a repetition. But legends aren't born that way. Legends are born out of freaking their opponents out, paralyzing their king, and then walking their opponent's king to the other side of the board and forcing a checkmate in the eight moves. King a6, there is a multitude of mates. Knight c5, knight b4, rook b6. How did this king end up here while Palugayevsky was up nine points of material? There was only one man that could make his opponents look like this in the 1950s and 60s, and his name was Rashid Nezhmedinov. I told you I would end the video with an incredible story, and this is it. So many things about this game are impressive. This is 1954. This is the fifth round of the Bucharest chess tournament being held in Romania. This is the only chess tournament that Rashid Nezhmedinov managed to play in his entire life outside of the Soviet Union. Think about that. All those incredible players got to play all over the world. Can you imagine what this man could have been if he learned chess earlier? If he had just a, a little bit more in life than he had. A little bit more of the opportunities. This is the only tournament he ever played outside of the Soviet Union in 1954, and he got second place behind Viktor Korchnoi. They granted him the international master title because of this tournament. That's it. This is the fifth round. His opponent is Enrico Paoli, and right before this round... His child was born. He sent a telegram to his wife at the time, and he said, I dedicate this game 
to our child. And he won the brilliancy prize for this game. Folks just didn't learn. They just didn't know. They, they kept playing the Sicilian against this man. And this game, he went all out. We've seen him attack people on the same side. But what happens when Rashid Nishmedinov gets to castle on the opposite side of you? As you can see from the advancement of his pawns, very bad things. Rook c8, pawn to g5. Knight e5, he slides out of the way and he's ready for his f pawn as well. This is just the worst possible situation you could find yourself in against Rashid Nishmedinov. The attack is right there. King b1, b4. He's waving the red flag in front of Enrico Paoli, the charging bull. And he ignores the attack completely. And it's already game over. Queen and rook battery. King stranded in the center of the board. Enrico Paoli struck with e5, trying to lock the position. And now, with all of this barreling down toward his king, he defends himself with his queen. And Rashid says, take my knight. Take my knight. Take it. There you go. I have a hanging knight. I have a hanging bishop. You have a hanging king. Pawn takes f7. You can't take. If you take, the queen gets in. It's game over. You got to slide out of the way. I can take the knight and promote to a queen with check. But instead, I'll go here. I will threaten your rook. I will threaten this. I will threaten promotion. You can take everything you want. Go ahead. My king is safe. Pawn takes d4. My king is safe. Just out of the way of danger. Rook h2 is literally mate. That's mate right there. It's threatened. But Rashid Nishmedinov was not going to be denied. And he gets there first. He gets there first like a James Bond movie. Winning the brilliancy prize for this game against Enrico Pauli. The day that his child was born. This is the only tournament he managed to play outside of the Soviet Union. And he was granted a, a international master title for this game. And for, this, uh, for his performance. Not for this game, but for his performance. Getting second place behind the legend Viktor Korchnoi. Viktor Korchnoi might be the greatest player to never become world champion. I might make a video about that too if you want it. You know, let me know in the comments. Rashid Nezhbedinov is unequivocally the best international master that has ever lived. The only reason he didn't get a Grand Master title, because nobody at the time was getting a Grand Master title. Between, between the 50s and 60s, like 10 people in the world got a Grand Master title. I mean, the Grand Master title was virtually invented in the 50s and 60s. Should he get a retroactive one? <laughs> look, at what, look at this. Look at what he's doing to people. It's ridiculous. His story and circumstances are unbelievable. I hope you enjoyed this historical deep dive. Do let me know if you have any uh, others that you would like to see in the comments. Get out of here.